last year, uh, including what uh, I guess uh, most of the people here are uh, known to the party bishop and uh, also the community. So I bring you this from him. And uh, we made this presentation uh, on his behalf. And uh, also in behalf of uh, the bishop of my diocese, who is here, uh, the bishop of Northern Philippines, uh, Brent Alawas. We thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us here and uh, for giving us, us this opportunity to share with you our story on uh, ABCD. Uh, ABCD would be, as you all know, uh, asset-based community development. But uh, we also refer to it as uh, a asset-based church development or asset-based congregational development. So it's all the same thing. And uh, so uh, uh, that's what we're going to share now. There's a, there's a lawyer in the Philippines uh, who was awarded uh, two years ago the uh, Max Sizer Peace Prize, who's supposed to be the Asian counterpart of the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, when he was introduced uh, to get his award, uh, a list of his positions and titles were read. Uh, and then he was asked, what do all those titles and positions mean? And he said, uh, all of those th things mean only one thing, that actually I'm just a storyteller, and that the law is the medium by which I made my story. In the same manner, I am just a storyteller, and I'm here to share with you a uh, story of our church. A uh, church that uh, most of us here belong to, or uh, used to belong to. <coughs> and a church that most of us here would know, like uh, Matthew would be, uh, would, uh, would be well known to the church in the Philippines, he has been there uh, once or twice. <coughs> so uh, it's a story of uh, how our church uh, became autonomous, and uh, it's a story of ABC in practice. And uh, as we all know, <coughs> This is a church that used to belong to the church here in America, <coughs> church in the U.S. And uh, we became a uh, separate church, the 28th province of the Anglican Communion, uh, some 21 years ago, or uh, on May 1st, 1990. That was, that was the day that uh, we became separated uh, from uh, our mother church, which again is the church here, and uh, which at the time was known to us as uh, the Episcopal Church in the USA, or ECUSA. That's uh, how we used to say it. In the Philippines, uh, ECUSA is well known all over the ECP. So uh, I guess some of us were there during the celebration on uh, May 1st, 1990. I don't know if uh, Mano here or uh, Ante Blandino were, were there. But uh, for those who were there at the time, that was, if you remember, that was a whole day celebration. You know, it was a festival of songs, dances, uh, everything. It's a big celebration, uh, May 1st, 1990. But today, in hindsight, I can stand up here and easily tell you and easily say that part of something that we did on that day, part of something that we did on that day, ordered on something that's very, very unpleasant. That was something else you wouldn't say at the time, but in hindsight, we can easily say that. And it's the reason for that. You would be more, uh, you would more relate to this story than we are. But you know, I teach at our seminary, at uh, St. Andrew's Theological Seminary. And I often ask my students there, do you know of any person, you know of any person who woke up one morning and said to his or her parents, Mom and Dad, I am now an adult. I'm going to move out of your household. I'm going to set up my own household, set up my own rules, follow my own dreams uh, and visions, uh, do everything on my own. But 60% of my living expenses you will have to provide. <laughs> if you were the parent, what would you say? Of course, you would say, you're crazy. 
you will talk about, or you must be joking. <laughs> Again, I tell my students, you are gathered in the Yosan Convention. You gathered in our annual the Yosan Convention, and a congregation stands up, representatives of congregation stand up and say, <coughs> we want to become a full-fledged parish, elect our own rector, come up with our own articles and bylaws, uh, follow our own rules, set up our own programs, but the diocese will provide 60% of our budget. Again, I guess uh, Bishop would be chairing the convention would say, what are you talking about? Are we joking here? Are you crazy? But that's exactly what we did in 1990. That was exactly what we did in 1990. We celebrated the day, May 1st, 1990. We said we were going to separate from the church in the US. We are now in Columbus Church. We have become an independent and autonomous church, but 60% of our budget, and that amounts to $1.16 million. $1.16 million would have to be provided by the church in the US, or it would have to be provided by our mother church. That's why we say now, that it bordered on something that's very unpleasant. And the unpleasantness of the fact is further emphasized. If we look at what consists the 40%, because the reality is that of the 40% which we consider to be local sources, a big part of that is actually income from endowment funds, from uh, assets, and from, uh, from funds that were given by the mother church, or it's by organiza organizations and agencies. So actually on the whole, what was only coming from us on the day that we stood up to say that we are becoming an independent and autonomous church was only 90%. 80% was coming from the mother church. Nobody said that we were crazy. Nobody said that we were joking. And in fact, we all celebrated. It was a big celebration of uh, our church becoming a, an independent province. And uh, I guess that, that uh, at the time, everybody also felt that uh, in view of the situation, the particular situation of our church at the time, Everybody thought that that was normal, that that was expected. And again, you would understand that if we go a little bit into our history, you've got to go back into a little bit of our history in order to understand why it was normal to do that at the time and why nobody said that we were crazy. So let's go back to the time of uh, the first bishop, first missionary bishop of uh, the Church of the Philippines. Uh, Bishop Charles Henry Grant, who, uh, who came to the Philippines at the turn of the 20th century. He was part of the American Occupation Forces, and when he went there, he first considered himself as chaplain to the American forces who were coming to the Philippines, uh, and uh, didn't want to do any mission work among the locals. Because at the time, the Philippines then, for the preceding 300 years, was under Spanish colonization. And all over the place, there were Catholic churches established by Spanish colonizers. And Bishop Brent did not want to, as he said, put an altar over another altar. So he considered himself only as chaplain to the American forces and uh, did not plan to do mission work among the locals. But this was changed when he visited the Cordillera Highlands. One of the Cordillera Highlands, which at the time, and even up to now, is home to indigenous communities that are collectively referred to as Igoros. And uh, a number of us who are here belong to that indigenous community. We are Igoros. So uh, Bishop Brent went there to the Cordillera Highlands and met his people. At the time, uh, the the, uh, the Cordillera Highlands with Igoros were, and uh, 
part of Mindanao or the southern part of the country. For also some indigenous communities that were collectively referred to as nomads, nomads. Together with the Ibrots and nomads and other indigenous communities elsewhere in the country, they were never subjugated or they were able to escape from um, Spanish colonization. That's why they maintain their way of life. They were never drawn into the mainstream of uh, Filipino colonial society. And when Bishop Brent went to the Cordillera Highlands and met the Igorots, he then made a decision that he's going to extend mission work <coughs> among these people, because according to him, these people, a dissertation from uh, Bishop Brent that was published in the newspaper at the time, they were in the position of Adam and Eve after the fall. Hence, there's the greatest need, and no one had held out, held out a helping hand to them. And so he decided that we will now extend mission work to these people. One of the first things that Bishop Brent did after the visit was to order a ton of soap to wash away the natives of grime and paganism. That was how he said it. A ton of soap to wash the natives of grime and paganism. That ton of soap was followed by a conversion process. That ton of soap then followed a conversion process, a process of making these people Christians, not making these indigenous communities Christians. And part of the conversion process saw tons and tons of buttermilk, vulgar, and other foodstuffs that flowed into the homes of the converted communities. I was uh, attending Sunday school in the late 1960s, and I was a beneficiary to those buttermilk that was distributed among those communities at the time, part of the whole conversion process. And according to Do the late Dr. William Henry Scott, an American Navy scientist, <coughs> he said that the main appeal to the converts seemed to have been materialistic. <coughs> Many of the missionaries frankly used their high living standards and economic power as an incentive to conversion. Free food stuff, clothing, buttermilk, and chocolates. I was never a beneficiary to two plates, and I would taste that. That was before my time. <laughs> but free food stuff, clothing, buttermilk, and two plates were distributed so frequently and in large amounts that it led to a strong sense of dependency as the converted communities regarded the church as a very rich institution from which material benefits can be derived. That's Dr. Scott. And that was true even up to our time. And uh, we are not talking here only, we are not talking here only about people going to mass and bringing home a can of buttermilk or a sack of burger. Now, uh, this is a story I, I, I always like to share. In the 70s and 80s, or in 1972, the president of the Philippines at the time declared martial law. And it plunged the country into an ending political and economic crisis and it resulted into massive grind in poverty and heightened political repression at the time, 70s and 80s. I was a student back in uh, the early 80s, especially after the assassination of a leading political opposition leader in 1983. I was a student then, and I remember that almost every day we were out or holding our classes into what we call them as the University of the Streets. Every day we were marching and protesting against dictatorship, against the, the uh, repression and uh, the, the uh, poverty, economic marginalization that everybody woke up into as the reality all over the land at the time. But the church in the Philippines, this one church in the Philippines, it can close the gates of Cathedral Heights those of you who have gone to, to the church in the Philippines, the national headquarters there is referred to as Cathedral Heights in Quezon City. It's an eight hectare property, and that's where the national office and uh, the national institutions are. And at the time, even with widespread poverty, even with hunger stalking the land at the time, even with heightened political repression, 
the church can close the gates of Cathedral Heights and live in relative affluence. Why? Because the church was heavily subsidized by American dollars that were not affected by the crisis that was happening in the country. The dollar inflows that came to our church every year was never affected by what's happening in the country. And what's worse is that the church even benefited every time that the crisis went worse. Why is that? Because it resulted into the devaluation of the Philippine peso, which means more pesos for our American dollars. It was a very, very bad situation because you're living in affluence in the midst of all those poverty. And uh, it was one of the reasons why actually one of the major factors that led the church eventually to embrace the challenge of autonomy. We cannot go on living like this detached from what's actually happening in our own land, in our own country. But back to, to uh, the story. Why is it that it was normal for us uh, to become autonomous even with 60% of our budget being provided by the church in the U.S., by our mother church, because of the many, many years of what Dr. Scott said, a sense of dependency, a strong sense of dependency that has been created, not only because of the food stuff that every member brought home after the Sunday service, but also because of the heavy dollar subsidy that came to the church every year, every year. We now say, we always say, that to those who have given us those resources, we will always be eternally grateful. We respectfully recognize and acknowledge <coughs> the thoughts, the love, the concern of those people who were able to mobilize these resources in order to be given to all communities. We will recognize that and we will forever be thankful for all those things, especially the thought that came with it. But we have to recognize the fact that that was disastrous as it initiated our communities into a world of dependency and mendicancy which exists even up to this time. And so you would understand why in 1990 nobody said we were crazy when we said that we are going to become independent and autonomous, even if more than one half of our budget was being provided by the Mother Church. Again, as we said earlier, if that happens now, or if that happens in your convention, or a congregation says they will become a parish, but ask for 60% of the budget, they would be in trouble. Everybody would think that they are crazy. But again, that was what happened. And uh, again, uh, that's the reason why, at the time, financial autonomy, despite our becoming an autonomous <coughs> church, financial autonomy was a very big question. It's a very big question, first, because we are not talking here only about, you know, uh, we have a relationship with uh, ERD now. And the ERD provides about, uh, about 5 million or 7 million pesos a year uh, to the church in the Philippines for its community development program. We are not talking here only about $7,000. We are talking here about millions of dollars that are given every year. Millions and millions of pesos that are given to the church there every year. So the sheer enormity, <coughs> the huge amount involved, made it almost impossible to even consider the fact that we will become an autonomous church on our own. And of course, since as we have seen earlier, the church was built in the highlands, in the indigenous communities where much of economic marginalization is very much felt. And of course, the pervasive thinking of many Filipinos who continue to look up to America as a source of salvation and consider the church as a rich institution for material benefits can be derived from it. Considering those things, it was almost impossible to even conceive of a possibility that we will become financially autonomous. And so at the time, even with autonomy, even uh, 
with our becoming an autonomous church, we talk about, we have to meet with the mother church and say, let's have to, let's work together. Let us, we, ha we need to work together so that at some point we can be financially self-reliant. Financial self-reliance became an obligation that was jointly accepted by both churches. And in order to do that, we uh, set up a covenant, covenant, uh, the agreement by which the two churches can then work towards eventual financial autonomy or financial self-reliance. And this covenant was uh, monitored by a committee, a joint committee, which uh, was called the uh, JCPC, which is up to now. But of course, uh, 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 that has been changed, no longer a covenant. Uh, uh, <coughs> but that was the committee that was set up to monitor and, and to plan out how then can we work together so that eventually we would achieve financial self-reliance. And so the committee went into planning. How do we do this? How then do we get to set up autonomy for this church that is heavily financed by, uh, by the mother church? First, we came up with a five-year plan. Five-year plan. Uh, and in fact, even we started the planning. JCPC actually was formed in 1986, even before 1990 or in 1987. It started already working. Uh, towards uh, setting up uh, financial autonomy. Uh, so in 88, we started with the five-year plan, but uh, this was later revised into what we call the 10-year capital resources build-up plan. And the idea was that uh, for the whole 10 years, uh, let's, let's put up a fund. There's no way by which we, become, we can become financially independent, financially self-reliant. How then do we do that? Let's put up a big fund. Let's put up a big fund, <coughs> about 272 million pesos, which would be a capital fund, an endowment fund, which would not be spent. It's all this income would be used to support us. And we are able to support that uh, to raise 272 million. Then we can become autonomous, uh, financially autonomous, because the income of that would be enough to sustain us. So uh, that was the capital resources build up plan, 10 year plan. And uh, while at the beginning there was some enthusiasm about it, it actually failed two or three years after we found out or we saw that this plan failed to materialize. <coughs> Local efforts, our part in the plan resulted in small change. I remember the time that, uh, that what a congregation can raise towards the plan is even less than the transportation cost of bringing it to the diocese. <laughs> no, so, so what's the point? Uh, it resulted in small change. And also, the projected contributions from partners did not come. Big part of the 270 million pesos that we were intending to raise was projected to come from foreign partners. And those did not come. <clears throat> so if we fail to materialize, we need to do another planning. For that. And that's when we conceived of the 15 years step reduction plan. Because it was so difficult, it was so difficult to raise funds, additional funds from elsewhere, even <coughs> locally and elsewhere. We said, why don't we just concentrate on this amount that we are getting from the mother church? We are, we are receiving this annual subsidy every year, we are receiving this amount. Why don't we concentrate on that? Why don't we say, that for 15 years, for 15 years, from 1993, actually, to 2007, that's 15 years, why don't we say we maintain the subsidy? Okay, let's say to the mother church, you give us the subsidy for 15 years, up to 2007. 2007, we end it. Uh, you give that to us in two, for 15 years, and we will reduce it every five years. So for the first five years, it would have to be maintained, would have to be maintained at, uh, at uh, $800,000. And uh, then the next five years, 
from uh, 98 to 2002 would be 533, and then from the last five years would be $260,000. You give us that, you give us this subsidy, and we will work out how we can become autonomous. And so our commitment was that uh, while we are getting these funds, while these subsidies being, being uh, given every year, part of it, a big part of it, $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year, would have to be would have to be set aside would have to be set aside and uh, to start the capital fund or the endowment fund that we were thinking about per year. We're going to raise 272 million pesos. In fact, we were not able to to raise anything. So let's get from this annual subsidy that we are getting set aside some of it. Some of it actually we started with fifty thousand dollars and then. Uh, it's doubled every year. So the first year would have to be uh, 50, the next year it has to be 100, next year it's going to be 150, until on the fifth year it will be reduced to 533, on the 10th year it will be reduced to 266, until in 2007 it becomes zero. So that was the plan, that was uh, what we, we did, that was what we conceived in order for us to become autonomous. Well, of course, that's okay. Well, of course, we were enthusiastic about it and we thought it was doable. It was actually the gradual <coughs> phase out. It was a gradual phase out until 2007. The gradual phase out of the annual subsidy under the plan actually resulted in financial crisis. Because you imagine you're receiving this money every year and suddenly it's being reduced, substantially reduced. It's like some, an addict, a person with an addiction, where if you try to reduce the addiction every year, it results in a painful withdrawal. And that was actually what happened. It was a painful withdrawal. withdrawal. We suffered every year annual budgetary deficits. It started annual deficit every year. Salary rates were frozen, and Bishop Brent here can attest to the fact that in his diocese, salaries of clergy were delayed. And at that one time, it was delayed up to six months. Mm -hmm. Imagine somebody working without any salary for six months. But that's how it is. Uh, the result of the gradual phase out, uh, salary rates were frozen and they were delayed. And we have to retire our catechists and lay evangelists we no longer cannot pay them, so you have to go. So we have to retire. So it was, again, a painful withdrawal. And it plunged us into every year of annual deficits. In nine, and so at the time, so at the time, uh, because of what's happening, at the time, it then led to a question among many of our people. People were then saying, what is this? What have you led us into? What have you led us into? You know, you remember the story of uh, that happened thousands and thousands of years ago, when people were led out of Egypt, then into the desert, the wilderness of sin, and people were saying, "What did you lead us into the desert to die?" <coughs> At least in Egypt, we were enjoying bread every day, we were having meat every day. That was the same question being raised at the time: What have you led us into? Uh, clergy and, uh, and our employees not receiving their salaries, uh, we no longer have categories and evangelists every year. Our budget was not enough to, to meet our needs, and so those questions were seriously being raised. The wisdom of autonomy was at stake. Everybody then questioning whether that was really the right decision. And so in, 19, in, 19, or, or, or in uh, 1997, we need to come together, we need to come together and remind ourselves, remind ourselves that despite all these things that are happening, despite all the difficulties that are happening, we still have a commitment. Don't forget that in 2007, that subsidy is going to end. The subsidy that's gradually being reduced every year, in 2007, that's going to end. And so we, 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 we went into visioning, into a visioning process that came up with what we call Vision 2007. Part of it is a reminder 
It's a reminder that in 2007, we will be fully self-supporting. Part of Vision 22 2007 that we made in 1997 was to remind ourselves that in 10 years time, we need to become self-supporting. That was our commitment. And so, that was the vision process in 2007. Years went by, and uh, in 2004, we are now in 2004. 2004, three years before 2007. And where are we in 2004? Our local income has greatly increased. It's resorted to 57 million. But we were still receiving substantial subsidies from the U.S. Uh, amounting to 9.3 million pesos. Amounting to 9.3 million pesos. For a total budget of 67.92 million. And still, we have a deficit of 1.5 million pesos. That was 2004, uh, which was the same thing actually during the, 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 the prime years. Every year we were receiving this uh, heavy subsidy. Every year we were having the visit. We looked at ourselves in 2004 and said, uh, where are we now? And that's actually the story. And we said, in three years' time, you remember that in two, three years' time, that subsidy is going to end. <coughs> that subsidy is going to end. <coughs> at the time, 2004, we looked at ourselves and we look up to 2007, and we look at it in the same manner. This is how we describe it. We look at it in the same manner that we look at death. 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 Death is something else that is sure to come to any person. All of us are going to die. At some point, death comes to every person. But nobody is thinking about death. Who would be thinking about death? Death is something that's very, very remote in our consciousness. We don't think about it. It never comes. Maybe when somebody dies, we are reminded of it. But otherwise, we don't think about death. It's remote. That's out of, out of our minds. That's exactly how we were looking at 2007 in 2004. We were only three years from the end of subsidy, and yet we don't think about it. People don't think about that. It will happen, but it's out of our consciousness. It's so remote and it's out of our consciousness. But again, it's sure to come. It's sure to come. That's why we need to think about it. We need to think about it. At the time, I remember that we had all these meetings. And if you remember, and if you look at that, it's 9.3 million pesos. 9.3 million pesos. I haven't even seen one million pesos. What about, what about uh, what more to 9 point? It was still a huge amount. 9.3 million was still a huge amount. And uh, it has gone down substantially from 29 in 1990. It went down to 9.3. But it was still a huge amount. And at the time, at the time, it seemed <coughs> that we, everybody was saying no more. We can no longer source out anything to add to that. We have reached the point where we can say that we have exhausted every possible source. No more. That's, that's, that's it. That's what we do. And so, in 2004, we went into a series of meetings. I remember that I, I joined all those meetings. And you know what we were talking about? You know what we were strategizing about? We were thinking about how can we go back to the Joint Committee on the Philippine Covenant? How can we go back to the mother church and say, can we extend 2007? Can we extend it to 2010? Everybody was thinking about what would be the best way to convince the mother church to extend. What can we do? What can we, what would be the best argument? We can go. The temptation for us to go to them, kneel down and beg for an extension was so strong, and we need to have some good arguments to back it up. How do we convince the mother church to continue the subsidy for another three years? 
<coughs> several meetings were held, long hours held to strategize the point. But eventually, we were able to say that if we are looking at 2007 in the same manner that we are looking at death, then why do we prolong the agony? Why do we prolong the agony? We believe in the resurrection. If we are fearing about death that will happen in 2007, why don't we die now? 